Okay, on to the message. We're back in Luke this week, picking it up. Now, I want to know how many of you know what that is. Somebody shout it out. El Cap, El Capitan, that is in Yosemite. That is a big piece of granite sticking up out of the ground. It's th almost 3,000 feet uh, from the base to the top. So 1958, some guys had an idea. We're going to climb that thing. We're going to rock climb up the side of that. And so over the course of 47 days, they got to the top. But those 47 days were spread out over 18 months. And so they would go up, they'd put in the anchors, put in the ropes, and they'd have to come back down, uh, wait, weather issues, all that kind of stuff. Eventually, they get to the top uh, after 47 days of climbing, 1958. In 1968, it was the first solo climb. So he used a lot of the anchors that had already been put in. He puts those in. He's able to go up, but he can't make it up in one day. And so he has to keep coming down and then going up a little further. And it takes him 10 days to get up the top of El Capitan. And then in 2017, a free solo climb. That means this guy had nothing but chalk. He had a little bag of chops strapped to his bag and he climbed up El Capitan with no ropes, almost 3,000 feet. And he did it in three hours and 56 minutes. It's unbelievable. I mean, really. So there's a documentary done, and it actually was nominated for an Oscar this year. And I missed it when it first came through the theaters. I was so bummed because I really wanted to see it. And then it came out for two weeks in IMAX. And so I took Judah and Sarah to go watch this movie called Free Solo. And Sarah could not look at the screen like 30% of the time because, I mean, it's crazy. Here's just a couple pictures. He has no ropes on, and he's climbing that thing. And the reason they showed this picture is because he actually has a crack to hang on to. I mean, not really. I mean, you know, what do you do with a crack like that? But he is holding on to that. So it was one of the safer parts of it. There were other places where, I mean, it's like he's on a wall of granite. I like the... Two quarters put together on their sides, that's what he had for his foot to sit on. I mean, it's, just, it's unbelievable. You got to see it. It's, I'm not a promoting the movie, but it's good. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's coming out on normal TV, uh, National Geographic Channel in March, uh, so you can look for that. But it's unreal. But the reason they showed that is because there were other places where it was more likely that he would fall to his death, and they didn't want to have the cameras on that. Um, and so in those places, it was more a pan back, you know, sort of telephotic lens. But, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And here's what, like, the climbing's awesome. But at the end of the climb, you know what he does? Are you kidding me? Like, he sits on the edge. It's like, <laughs> like, even that picture right there, just the heebie-jeebies, you know? It's just kind of like, how do you do that? I mean, it's unbelievable. So what's unbelievable about it is I think this is an example of as close to perfect as you can get. Like, he climbed up that mountain that had never been climbed up like this before. They talk about, like, nobody would be crazy enough to try it again. And he did it perfectly. Like, everything went according to as it was to go. He gets up in under four hours, which nobody expected. The camera crews had to race to try and get to their spots because he was ahead of schedule. It was for a, somebody who is a rock climber, this is perfection. And I like that. I like excellence. It's, people ask me all the time, like, what's your favorite thing about being a chaplain for the Dodgers? My favorite thing is I get to be around the people who are the best in the world at what they do. So I get to watch them work on their craft, and I get to watch them execute their craft. And not just for the Dodgers, but all the teams that come through. And it's awesome to see that level of excellence. Well, a couple months ago in San Francisco, one of the Indie Film Awards was going on, and so Alex Honnold went uh, to that, and he had a buddy who writes for Climbing Magazine, and so he texted him, hey, I'm going to be in San Francisco, can I crash on your couch? That's the kind of guy he is. Even though, like, other people would pay his expense at a hotel, he wanted to stay at his buddy's house. And so he goes and stays at this guy's house, and the guy writes an article about it in Climbing Magazine. I don't read Climbing Magazine. I just happened to like, really like this story, and so I was reading all that I could on it. And this is what he writes. He says, they say don't meet your heroes because they'll just disappoint you. But I say no way. I think putting a little human in our heroes is something we all could use. It's nice to know that no one on planet Earth has all their stuff together. 
Your heroes are probably good at something very specific, but the rest of their life is full of the same mundane woes, worries, chores, toil, and hassles that plague us all. And like the rest of us, they have their preferences and predilections, their failings and foibles. They either like kale or they don't. <laughs> They've either seen the wire or they haven't. They either think that East of Eden is the great work of, greatest work of fiction ever or they don't. They either drink whiskey or water. In the climbing realm, this means they are no more enlightened nor understand more about life than you do just because they happen to be insanely good at our sport. Guess what? And this is how he ends it. Heroes are not gods. They do not have special access to secret knowledge we peons will eternally grasp for. They are human beings. They know no more about how to deal with living, loving, or dying than the next guy. Now, what struck me about that is he's right on. Like, I think sometimes we tend to think of somebody as really good at something. They're really good at all of life. I mean, think about the people we give a voice to and actually pay attention to who talk about things like global poverty and politics and those sorts of things, health issues, vaccinations, those kinds of things. Just because they're really good at X, we want them to talk about Y and Z. And they're not that good at it. But I think on the other end of things, sometimes we think of Jesus as a hero. And we think Jesus might be really good at paying for our sins, but maybe he doesn't have the rest of it figured out. I got to figure it out on my own. And what we're going to see today is the way Luke tells this story, the way he puts kind of two stories next to each other very intentionally, is he's telling us, no, Jesus is not a hero. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord over life, over death, and over love. Jesus is Lord. That was the confession of the early Christian church, those first century Christians. And Jesus is Lord over life and death and everything in between. So open your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, and let's take a look at these stories and see how Luke tells them and why he tells them that way. Luke chapter 7, it's on page 863. In your Bibles, if you want to grab one from under the chairs, we took a little break from Luke as uh, Joe just did an incredible series on uh, kind of our identity issues and anxiety and those sorts of things. And if you weren't here for any of those, I encourage you to go online and uh, watch those or listen to them uh, because they're just fantastic. And so just to give you a little context, Jesus uh, has just given the way that Luke records the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so each of the Gospels tell us about Jesus' life with a specific purpose, and so they arrange stories in particular ways to communicate those stories. And so Luke has just told us about the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus kind of gives his teaching. This is what the kingdom of God is like. This is what the characteristics are. This is what the people are, and you'd be wise to build your life on this. And then in chapter 7, Jesus moves on to interact with two people, and Luke gives us first his encounter with a centurion, chapter 7, verse 1. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued by him. And when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him to elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them, and, he was not afraid, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. But say the word, and let my servant be healed, for I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. A centurion. Well, we don't know exactly what this centurion is. The reason is because this is uh, probably in the late 20s AD or the early 30s AD, depending on when you date the birth of Christ, and we don't know exactly. But it's probably around 28 AD, 
Rome doesn't actually send uh, soldiers and guards to be over that area in sort of a dominating way until 44 AD. So we don't know if this is somebody who is sort of kind of a first pass of those Roman soldiers or if he was some other sort of a local authority, but he is in charge of troops. He is a man of influence. He's a man of power. He's a man of wealth. And he's a Gentile. This is who Luke gives us as the face of the Gentiles. It's the first interaction in Luke's gospel with somebody who's not Jewish. And so there's something significant to that. And Luke tells the story, Jesus in Capernaum, north side of Galilee. This is where a lot of his miracles took place up in that area. And he's heard about them. News was spreading, as Luke tells us in the earlier chapters about this Jesus and what he's doing. And so this centurion hears about Jesus, hears that he's coming to town and goes to what you or I would do if we knew somebody who knew somebody. Hey, can you go talk to so-and-so and see if they can help me out? So this is what the centurion does. He goes to the elders of the Jews, the Jewish synagogue, and he says, hey, could you guys go talk to Jesus and tell Jesus, I've got a, one of my servants who's sick, probably close to the point of death, and ask if he could come help me out. And so the elders do it. They go to Jesus, and they say, hey, Jesus, we got this guy. And you, let, you notice how they described him? He's a good guy. Listen to how they describe him. Go back and look at verse 3 again. And when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent, him, sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him. So the elders are like, this is a good guy. The reason he's a good guy is because he loves the Jewish nation and he built our synagogue. Now, we don't know exactly what that means that he built the synagogue. It could mean he used his troops uh, as laborers to build the synagogue. It could mean that he donated a fat chuck and change to help build the synagogue. Or it could simply be that his troops are maintaining the synagogue. But either way, he has done something. He is good to the Jewish people and he has tangibly helped them with the synagogue now, that's important. The reason that's important is because the reason you helped a synagogue, the reason you built something, is the same reason that somebody donates a ton of money to get their name on a building at a university, right? There's some honor in that. And even much more so than in our culture, you were honored because you put that name on that. So this guy probably in some sense has his name on the synagogue, does that for the synagogue so that he, he, it wasn't just altruism, it was a way to achieve honor in that culture. And so he has this honorable position as some sort of a benevolent giver. He's got power because he's authority over these troops, seems like a good guy, and the Jews say, he is worthy, Jesus, of you coming to help him. Not is he just a good guy with regard to the Jews, but he's a good guy with regard to the servant too. And I think we miss that sometimes because of the way we write it in English. But if you look at verse two again, now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued by him. And I think sometimes we read that, or at least I do, and my first impression was like he doesn't want to lose this laborer. Like he doesn't want to lose something that's really contributing to what he's got going on. But that's really not the sense of it. The sense of it is he was dear to him. This servant meant a lot to him, not work-wise, but there was a relational level here, which is also unique. Like this is just a good guy, a wealthy good guy, a powerful good guy, an influential good guy, and a good guy. And so the Jewish leaders go to Jesus and they say, he is worthy of your help. Now contrast that with how the Gentile describes himself. Verse, verse, uh, we'll start in verse 4 again. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built for us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy 
to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. The Jewish leaders, he's worthy. The Gentile views himself and says, I'm unworthy. This is somebody who built a synagogue for honor. Somebody who had a position of power, somebody who had a position of influence, and he looks at Jesus and says, I'm not worthy. What is Luke telling us? God's people don't get it yet. They're still working under the worldview that a lot of us work under. I can be worthy of God's grace. I can be worthy of God's help. If I live a certain way, then God is obligated to help me. God is obligated to do something in return for what I've done for him. And the Gentile understands that's not how it works. That Jesus is a man of authority, authority over life and death. He's seen this. Word has spread throughout the region that Jesus is doing stuff like this. And his perspective is, I'm unworthy. He understands grace more than God's people. Lord, I am unworthy. And this man who had every reason to be proud humbles himself and says, Lord, could you help my servant? He means a lot to me. And I know all you have to do is speak the word and he'll be healed. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Look again in verse 8. For I too am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, to, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Jesus responds to the faith and the humility of the centurion. He does what he asks. And he looks at the Jewish people, God's people, the crowds who have been following him, and he says, I haven't seen that kind of faith in you. Implying you guys are still thinking that I do this quid pro quo. That you deserve it because of something you've done, or you deserve it because you're God's people. And Jesus says, that's not the way it works. The centurion gets it. He understands that it's by grace, that he doesn't deserve it. He's unworthy. Man, that kind of faith, I'm going to reward that. That's the kind of situation that I'm going to be gracious in. So that's the first story. First story, a man, a man with power, a man with influence, a man with wealth, and a good man. The second story, and this is Luke often does this both in his gospel and in the book of Acts, is almost the opposite. It's a woman, incredibly vulnerable, and incredibly grieved because of what's happened. Pick it up in verse 11. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and Nain's about 25 miles from where Capernaum is, about five miles from where Jesus was raised in Nazareth, so people in the area obviously know who he is. And his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. That's like a double death sentence for a woman in the first century. Your husband was your source of protection and provision, and she's a widow now, so she doesn't have a husband. But in his place, she had a son, and the son could provide and could protect for her and could uh, vouch for her and uh, work for her, and now her son is dead. And you have a widow who's vulnerable, who's got nothing, is probably going to become a beggar. That was how many widows got by, was just begging. And Jesus sees this. Verse 13, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. 
And the dead man sat up, began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole country of Judea and all the surrounding country. You just picture this. Jesus is walking into this town, getting close to the city gate, and as he's getting close to the city gate, you see this funeral procession coming out. And I think sometimes we don't quite get the emotion of that sort of a funeral possession, procession. And the reason that is because we're inoculated. Uh, maybe that's not the right way. We're, we're sort of protected and sheltered from death in our culture. Up until like the early 1900s, the body stayed at your house. That's where the viewing was. And then it was carried off to the cemetery. Today, oftentimes, we never see the dead body. The body dies, let's say, in a hospital or in the nursing home, and we may go say our final goodbye, but then it's carried off to the funeral home, and they take care of it at the funeral home, and depending on if you have an open or closed casket or a cremation, you may never see the body again. It's been sanitized, it doesn't stink, all those kinds of things. But here's a woman who has her son. I mean, talk about grief. The hardest funerals to do are the death of children. It's just, there's nothing that causes more grief for an individual than the loss of a child. It's just out of order. It's not the way things are supposed to go. And she's coming out not just grieving over the death of her son, but there's also this sense of what's next. What is possibly going to happen? How am I going to get by? How am I going to survive? And Jesus sees the procession coming out, which probably include people who, like that was their job to be mourners with funeral processions. I never understood that. I thought that's kind of over the top. But I was reading a little bit about culturally what that was, and it, it made a ton of sense to me. If you've been to a funeral, especially a funeral for a child, um, the grief of the parents and the wailing of the mother. I mean, just inconsolable sometimes, and rightly so. And the reason they hired these mourners is so that the parent wouldn't feel alone in that weeping. That she could have the freedom to express her emotions because others around her were sort of doing the same thing. I thought, man, that, that actually makes a lot of sense. And so you have this group coming out of the city. Jesus is coming with a crowd this way, and Jesus immediately knows what's going on. And Jesus has compassion. In the first story, he's moved by faith. In the second story, he's moved by compassion. And he comes to the woman's son on the bier, which is just like what we roll the coffin on today, except it didn't have wheels. It was the frame that they were carrying the coffin on. And he says, arise. And the son gets up. And Jesus, it says, gives him to his mother. Just like that. Jesus is Lord of life and death. That's Luke's point. He's not a hero. He's not just an example to live by. Jesus is Lord over life and death and everything in between. And there's something else that's going on behind these stories. God doesn't matter who you are, whether you're rich and powerful and a man of influence or poor and vulnerable with no hope, God cares about you and you can be a recipient of God's grace. No matter who you are in here this morning, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how much success you've had or lack of success you've lived, God's grace is sufficient for you. That's the heart of God as we see in Jesus in these stories. And I think sometimes we pigeonhole people. Like, that person does not deserve it. That person doesn't deserve God's grace. Or that person could never be a recipient of God's grace. And Luke's like blowing a hole in that. No. Nope. Rich, poor, male, female, slave, free man, doesn't matter. God's grace is sufficient. But there's something else going on behind these stories. And what's going on behind these stories is we see God's people finding their place in God's story. As Joe talked about for the last three weeks, we have a real identity problem in our culture. And part of that identity problem is we're looking at the me. Uh, 
We're looking and thinking of ourselves as unique and special. In order to have self-esteem, we need to be unique and special. And we're trying to look for that uniqueness and that specialness in places that are always going to disappoint. And the way Luke tells his story, he's very intentionally pointing out that the right way is for God's people to find their place in God's story. And what I mean by that is there's a couple things that happen in the way Luke puts these stories together that are allusions to what God has done in the past. There's a sense that, hey, this is what God did then, and we're a part of that. And it's stories that happened with Elijah and Elisha. We went through First and Second Kings last year, so we heard about them, but just to refresh your memory, Elisha healed somebody, and Luke has already referred to that healing. The person that Elisha uh, healed was a guy named Naaman. And if you remember the story of Naaman, Naaman was a captain. He was over the troops, much like the centurion. Not only was he over the troops, but he had to leave his place and go over to see Elisha. And Elisha is a man of God. But the king, when Naaman comes to him, he's like, Can we possibly? I can't do anything about this. And he thinks he's going to get crushed by Syria again. Another Gentile, Naaman, military leader, comes. And this is how Elisha responds. And this is how it's recorded in 1 Kings. Then Elijah, dang it, I got those backwards again. Uh, (laughs) Wait, wait, we go back. Oh, wait, I didn't get them backwards. I was just too far ahead on the slides. Did we get that back up there, Tim? There we go. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Go back to Luke chapter 7. How do they describe it? Verse 16. Fear seized them all and they glorified God saying, a great prophet has arisen among us. Again, Naaman's already been referenced in chapter 4 of Luke. There's this sense of, wow, what God is doing. God is among us. God is doing something. Just like he did for them, he's doing among us. And now the second story is Elijah. If you're familiar with Elijah, what Elijah did was went and saw a widow during a time of famine, and the widow has nothing left except a last meal for her and her son. And Elijah says, well, feed me with that. She's like, no, you don't understand. This is our last meal. And Elijah says, I know, give it to me, and God will provide for you. And so she gives it to him, and God provides for this widow and her son all throughout the famine. The famine ends, and the son dies. And you can imagine the disappointment of the mom. Like, are you kidding me? Why did you save us if this is what was going to happen? And Elijah visits the widow. Elijah stretched himself upon the child there three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and gave him to his mother. What does Jesus do with the child here? Verse 14 again. And he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. These are allusions back to the work of God in the Old Testament. Now, there's some key differences here. The key difference is, is Elijah and Elisha had to appeal to God. Jesus makes no appeal to God. Why? Because Jesus is Lord over life and death. And Jesus heals the centurion's servant, and Jesus heals the widow's son. God knows no difference between male and female as far as value is concerned. He sees no difference between rich and poor as far as value is concerned. God, in his grace, responds. And as Lord of life and death, There's always hope. There's always hope that God is doing something. 
And notice how the people rejoiced. It didn't happen to them. It happened to a widow's son. It didn't happen to them. It happened to a centurion's servant. And yet the crowds glorify God. They're finding their story in God's story. Do you rejoice as much when it happens to somebody else as you would if it happened to you? Do you weep as much as if it happened to you when it happens to somebody else? Do you celebrate what God is doing around the world? What God is doing in the life of OCF, what God is doing in individuals in OCF, does that encourage you? Luke says it should. Because Jesus is Lord of life and death, and Jesus is doing something, and he will continue to do something, and that's the story that all of us are part of, and that what's, that's what gives us value. That's what makes us significant. It's not that we're male or female, not that we're rich or poor, but simply that God in his grace has reached out to us and made us a part of his people. Lord of life and death. There's hope in that. Let's pray.